and he wanted me to look at his materials, and I was like floored. He had this eight foot diameter steel culvert that you could walk through, and you could go underneath, and it like echoes. So he's got two of those. So we're gonna meet, we're gonna move that to the playground, and that's gonna be the entrance to the playground. Welcome to the Creators here at Sun City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators, creators videos, by making creators. Making what you make. Today on The Creators, Terrence Parker is a landscape architect and sculptor who has forged the two fields with works like Stone Bale and the recent Working, a creation that puts steel hammers in apparent motion on the rails and wheels that is the industrial backbone of the Northeast. So we invite you to subscribe and give us a thumbs up. Well, you got to watch the show first, so let's get on with the show. Hey, and welcome to The Creators of Some City. Bill Rogers here with... Terrence Parker. Morning, Terrence. Hello, Bill. Good morning to you. Thanks for coming in. And, My uh, pleasure. And welcome to The Creators. So uh, as, we, as we always do, wanted to start off by asking, do you consider yourself a creator? Does that, does that term, being a creator, does it have any significance for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't... I've always considered myself a creator. I mean, that's a, a high order of business, I think, to create things for... Um, for personal expression and for uh, community expression. Yeah, and a uh, landscape uh, landscape architect, uh, as well as I, I know you as a, a visual artist in terms of your sculptures. Uh, I have had the good opportunity to work on a couple of projects. Uh, yes, you have. Uh, featuring your featuring your work, uh, as well as the Pechacucha on the Music Hall Arch. Um, is there a relationship, a, con a connection between your work as a landscape architect and your uh, work as a, as a visual artist? Uh, yeah, it's, it's site-driven, really. So uh, I guess I grew up just having a real eye for uh, landscape patterns, you know, human patterns on the land, and then, you know, vegetative patterns as well. So it's all about kind of f fleshing out patterns. Sure. You know, um, you know, human, humans have a lot of history and they leave a lot of marks on the land and they have for centuries. So, you know, part of what I've done recently is pull out some of those patterns to, you know, create things that have expression of human history. Um, particularly in the, the working sculpture the, with the giant hammers. Sure, the most the, recent one. The most recent one behind the um, uh, Foundry Place parking garage in Portsmouth, which was the first... 1% for the arts competition in the city of Portsmouth that was built. So I won that, that was competition, and I chose to pull out all the patterns of the, you know, the railroad, the industrial history, the history of forges and foundries, you know, f you know hand-making tool makers from the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, and then the working history, the people that worked at those industries um, that probably work, uh, lived and worked in the McDonough Street neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, with, that, with that project uh, uh, getting hit by the light here, it'll stay wide over on me. I'll try to stand and keep me from slouching. Yeah, you're in the sun uh, now. <laughs> yeah. Um, with, that, with that piece and the, uh, and, and the site itself, a, uh, uh, a roundabout... Turning circle, yeah. Turning circle. Was circle. The tr w did you have a say in that, or was that a given? That was a given. There were, um, there were very few, from my perspective, very few um, opportunities to do art on that site. There was very little landscape left. The landscape opportunities were a sidewalk that went along the building, uh, a 34-foot diameter traffic circle, and then the, the six-story uh, stairway tower that was all glassed. So, other than that, that was the only site, that 34-foot uh, traffic circle, mm -hmm. the only site site. Yes. And so what, what, uh, what, what, what went through your head when you saw the... Well, um, you know, found, the, the word foundry, I think, you know, Peter Hapney, the blacksmith, is, he's in a butter there, and I have a long history of doing things with him, and he works hard, you know, it's all, you know, he, bending steel, you know, it's all hammer work, right, hammer, fire steel and then I've you know as a builder of things you know designer and builder I've had a lot of exposure to people doing uh, labor 
you know, carpenters, stonemasons in particular. And, you know, myself, I, you know, I had, I've worked a shovel enough times in my life to know what it's like to be on the, in a trench, you know, working with hammers and shovels. You know, I carved stone books for a while. So it, it was about that kind of, uh, that industry, the people working with their hands that never really get recognized for the things that they build. You know, they build something and someone else's name goes on it, the client's name most, mostly, and they don't get recognized. So, you know, I wanted it to be about people, you know, in forges and foundries, um, you know, people who worked. How, um, not to get too esoteric about it, but, but how much of, of your own work and of that work in particular um, is the voice coming out of this collaboration with other people versus the, uh, you know, the single-minded voice, your vision in this? Well, it's, it was a pretty single-minded operation in that I, you know, I was really possessed by the concept of that whole project. Um, I'm a pretty competitive guy, you know, sports and other things, coaching and, you know, and, and you know, creating ideas is another form of, of being in the mix for me. So um, I was really taken by this project and I wanted to acknowledge the people that have helped me in the past. It's kind of like team building. You have an idea and you put your team together to create the, you know, the best team that you can and to create the best product that you can. So it's mostly about you know, finding a vision. And then part of my process is to uh, ask my friends, you know, designer friends. I had a lot of people that I would give, get criticisms from. You know, that's a big part for me is to vet my ideas through others, you know, other, other landscape people, uh, you know, my family you know, my office mate, graphic designer, architect, uh, you know, arch people who have a sense of concepts. Well, the best of the uh, capitalistic system of, of uh, collision of ideas. Uh, <laughs> collision. <laughs> and well, this is more of a collaboration than a collision, but uh, I like your term. Yeah. Um, so after I had this idea, I, I just knew I had to work with certain people. And Peter Hapney was the foremost of that because I really enjoy his process and his skill set. And then he brought in another uh, blacksmith named Dave Court up in um, near Tilton. I'm not sure of the exact town, but near Tilton, way up in New Hampshire. And then I knew, you know, my friend and builder and artist Carl Achel was an integral part because I always had him over my shoulder when I was doing all these clay models. So I would get my proportions right. So it wasn't just my eyes on things because mm -hmm. I, I like to have, you know, checks and balances so I don't. You know, so I don't make a mistake, really. <laughs> How about the relationship between um, your, again, your work as a landscape architect, where designing sites and maybe the flow of sites versus an artistic vision, uh, which I, th I think of looking at a particular work and seeing something in that work, in that, that uh, moment in time. Um, do, do those world, how, how do those worlds fit together? And actually, maybe an opportunity to talk about your other work uh, as a landscape architect, thinking of the outdoor classroom in uh, South Berwick, perhaps the music hall, the arches, the music hall in Portsmouth, and designing... And that streetscape, yeah. yeah so yeah. a lot of what I do has to be client-driven, right? I, I, I mean, the, work, the working sculpture was me as my own client. I was able to push my idea as far as I wanted to, but mostly... I'm being hired by other people to create ideas for them. And some people really don't want ideas. They want just, you know, I, I want planting over here. I want a walkway. I want a courtyard. I want, you know, I want solutions to site problems. So first of all, you have to read the site problem. Again, it gets back to patterns. These aren't necessarily human patterns. They're more like, you know, the flow of water, the type of soil, the, you know, the, the way the air is moving, the way the sun, you know, moves around a site. So. It's about site patterns, so sometimes uh, people don't want much more than, uh, you know, a really nice garden, and I, I enjoy doing that. You know, that's always a challenge to combine colors and, you know, to, you know make it beautiful for people. Um, but some of the other things, when they're, and sometimes people ask me to create ideas. Uh, Janet Prince and Peter Berg, one of my early clients, they were like, they said, you know, come up with ideas, you know, for 
And that's how I created this stone bookshelf for them in Newcastle one time. And, and so they, when, they, when they have a property, they, they're really into ideas because that's their business. So coming up with ideas, would it be, for example, uh, how people will approach what, what kind of, uh, what, what kind of uh, how are you encouraging people to move around this site? Or it, uh, did the ideas play out in terms of uh, the color red in a flower? Or um, um, It could be all of those things. So a lot of times um, it's, it's, you know, there's some, uh, you know, solutions to, you know, um, circulation issues, you know, you, you want a terrace that flows out from a, a larger room on the inside of the house. It's about blending the interior and the exterior. So sometimes there's not a, a lot of opportunity for art per se, mm -hmm. but there's opportunity to create, you know, a really high aesthetic situation where you're creating spaces. You're creating spaces for people to interact with their landscape. So that's a different type of art. Sure. It's kind of like not in the art realm, but it's like you're creating an aesthetic solution for people's, you know, uh, domestic uh, movements. Can we uh, can we bring up an image from uh, the Peterberg Janet Prince? Uh, do you have some of those on your on your site? No, not right, not at this moment. But uh, I can bring them up on the screen. Um, uh, are, are those are those private? Well, there's those, um, public, no. They they've been part of the kitchen tour of the music hall, so I don't think they would mind, but. Um, you know, for instance, their, their, prop, their recent property had this incredible root pattern. You know, we, it was a, a, a wisteria that overwhelmed the house, and, the root, and once we pulled the leaves and the soil back a little, you saw this incredible um, web of roots that I actually hadn't seen such a dense root pattern, especially from a plant like wisteria. So I kind of tried to create it, I created a, a, a woven terrace pattern of the stone that mm. kind of pulled pulled some of the the weaving of the root and I did that with stone um, so that looks really beautiful um, and you know they have a real eye for detail so you have to really perform for some people that you know because they just you know just have an eye for mm -hmm. beauty so they kind of inspire you when people when a client really loves their landscape and wants to see something interesting that you're more inspired to like push your own limits so that, that, that terrace has this really intricate pattern of, you know, granite stripes and bluestone and some color patterns in there that um, is woven. So it makes reference to the, the, the you know, the, the invasive plant that we had to pull out. Mm -hmm. But it makes for a beautiful terrace. It's like uh, some, a mosaic in a carpet, for instance, on, on the ground in stone. Mm -hmm. Well, thinking of <clears throat> something uh, kind of related, the sculpture you did uh, called The Being, um, and coming from out of a, a log that you found. On yeah, the, yeah, on the that ground. was, yeah. Would you describe that as a log? That uh, Well, it's a piece of driftwood, and I, I think it was an old apple tree. So it had some human form to it, and then I shaped it a little more to make it a little more human, and then I, it was really, it was buried in the sand up to its elbow, and I was, it was a little island in Nor, uh, Norwalk River in Connecticut that a friend and I had canoed out to just, you know, for fun. And then I saw this thing and we dug it up and it was like, this is like too cool to leave here. So we, it was really heavy because it was saturated. And then I dried it out and I burnt it because I wanted it not to look like wood. And then it was really, you know, human-like, really mm. figurative. It now sits at the, um, the Liars Bench Brewery. It's made in bronze now because I carried this thing around for like, 30 years in my office, it always hovered above my shoulder, and it was starting to fall apart because it was old driftwood, so it's now bronze, and it's, it's out there in public view at the Liars Bench. It's a very different process from um, a project where you have a client, and uh, they, they come to you and say, what can we do here, in this case, something yeah. you saw? Yeah, sc sculpture is really expensive, so... Um, to do your own sculpture, it's like takes a lot of space, and the materials are expensive unless you're doing it out of paper mache or found objects, which I haven't really done yet. Well, the being was a found object that was converted to bronze, but so um, I I'd like to work on paper until <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm a sight artist mostly, so I depend on the opportunity for someone to want their sight to be articulated in a form. You know, so I don't. Do a lot of like sculpture just to do sculpture. Well, another uh, big thing 
in a similar in a similar vein uh, is a piece that folks who live around here might happen upon as they're driving up a road, which is an enormous hay bale sitting in a field. Uh, but it's not it's not a hay bale. It's actually a stone. A stone structure. bale, yeah. So. Uh, and uh, yeah, you did a couple of nice videos for me on the being the one that fly over. Yes. Yeah, and then uh, then you did one on the stone bale too. Mm -hmm. So the stone bale was uh, my friend Todd Adelman had this piece of property that was being hayed in the big circular hay bales, and Todd had uh, the ambition to do a a, fest a cultural festival out on that property. It's in Rollingsford. It's the like uh, really bucolic. It's one of the quintessential landscapes of this area. Uh, off of um, Roberts Road, uh, in, right in Rollinsford. So uh, he wanted a sculpture that would be a landmark for this cultural festival. So I went out there and studied the property and all those rolling hills, and it was, you know, it became apparent to me that I had to make a stone, a stone, uh, a stone bale is what I called it. But the stone bale is really based on my my master's thesis when I was at the University of Georgia, which was about using stone to reflect human patterns in the land. It was mm, called um, mm -hmm. uh, An Archetypal Landscape for Southern New England. Um, so I used, I studied, you know, mill found, you know, remnant foundations from colonial times, mill foundations, stone piles, you know, barn foundations, house foundations, stone walls, agricultural piles, um, and those reflect human effort, and I was really intrigued by the, the human effort that was only visible through the stone walls and the, the foundations and so forth. So, so I did this whole thesis on that to make it, to, you know, to defend it as a really good idea. And so that, that was done in 1984. And so the stone bale is really an old idea from 1984 that I, I've always had in the back of my head that was uh, reflected in the stone bale. Mm -hmm. So that. So in, in what field was that? Um, in what field was the thesis? Was that as part landscape of your... arch a master's for landscape architecture? Mm -hmm. So that really that whole idea came about from a trip to Japan in 1982, where we I went with my fellow students and a Korean professor to Japan to study the uh, Japanese stone temples, and mm -hmm. they 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 create a lot of narratives or contemplative stories through the articulation of really beautiful pieces of stone. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sparked an idea in me, it's like, well, New England is full of stone, how come we don't, we don't create our own cultural narratives or symbolic landscapes that are contemplative with our own stone? So I kind of, I had to, because it's a thesis, you had to like prove why it's a good idea. So you had to like document, you know, spirituality in stone, uh, other cultures use of stone, artists use of stone, the geology of the area, and then present, and then create a, a site design to articulate or to, uh, yeah, to articulate that idea in an actual site. Mm -hmm. So um, that was all sparked by a trip to Japan, and that was done in 84, and then after that I did this, this landscape on my personal property called the Stone Occurrence, but the Stone Bale is an old it's the f a new form from an old idea. Yes, and so, I'm sorry. So that that represents in in a, in 50 years or 100 years when that site, if it's not in agriculture, it could be in a forest. You know, you're going to walk through a forest and see a stone bale, and you're going to wonder what the heck is that all about. And then you're going to the stone bale will tell you that this was once an open field that was hayed, and as I, stone walls yes, tell you a, now. Mm -hmm. That, that that was once agricultural land that's now in forest. It's like why is there a stone wall in the middle of a forest? Well, it was. It was cleared for, you know, for animals, for plowing, for, you know, for hay, for whatever whatever they were growing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, those all those th that's part of the landscape patterns that are really human patterns, that, you know, I'm really interested in, and, um, and that's what the working sculpture was all about, which is all. It goes back to my master's thesis at University of Georgia. So, I mean, a lot of things go back to that, really. And, and how uh, has the reception been to working? I think it's been really good. You know, I, um, I don't know. I, I, I don't do social media enough to know that, you know, how things are, you know, 
I think everybody who's seen it really likes it, and it's really compelling. I love I love to look at it, and you know, so I don't really worry about that stuff. Mm -hmm. But you know, for instance, there was a, uh, when I was out there at the working site, like laying the railroad track where nothing was even visible yet. This interior designer I know um, was tr visiting Peter Hapney's Forge to pick up something he was working on for one of her clients. And she saw me out there and she's like, what the heck are you doing out here? And I told her what was going on and she goes, aren't you stressed? Aren't you worried? And I was like, what do you mean? Aren't I worried about, what am I worried about? I was like, how's it going to look? Aren't you worried how it's, how it's going to turn out? And it's like, it never struck me that I'd be worried about how it turned out. I was. My only worry with that project was not winning. I was because I, I was always confident that it was going to be what I wanted, at least to my aesthetic. So it, it pleased me from the moment I did it in the drawings. It pleased me in the end, and I was never worried about how it was going to be perceived or whether other people were going to like it. I knew I was going to like it, and that was that's enough to drive you. Other, if you worry about whether other people are going to think, you're not going to create something that's. I mean, you you run the risk of failing I think so she she put that it's like aren't you worried about what it's gonna it's like no no <laughs> the worry's over I won mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah you know it's because it's a hard thing to win stuff yeah I mean there's a lot of people didn't win it so it's like I can appreciate the losing part so moving forward um, other uh, other uh, things kicking around in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, visual arts projects uh, is your focus more on uh, client work these days? Oh yeah, you have to be focused on client work because you have to make a living, right? <laughs> right. Um, you know, I, you know, all that for the, again on the working thing. I, it's like I had two, like two hundred hours of design time in, and I could lose, and then you don't get paid a penny when you lose. And not that I got paid for the speculation of design. I get, I, I worked in some payment in the actual execution of the design. So right now I'm focused on, you know, uh, just doing client work. Um, but, you know, uh, I won the job to do the uh, Rock Street Park, which is abutting the working sculpture. That park gets a renovation. The city of Portsmouth had that on the table, you know, a year ago. And I competed for that design and I won that project. And I, I'm doing it with uh, Alex Ross, the structural engineer who worked on the working sculpture, he he figured out all the footings and stuff, and uh, so he's he's one of my partners, partners in design. So the two of us uh, did the Rock Street Park, and that's going to be nice. It's going to be simple, but uh, that'll be nice. And then um, then I'm doing a playground in uh, Hampton Falls. It's really interesting. Um, in that the playground is um, inspired by a contractor who has a kid there who used to be a is a client of mine. He's hiring me to design a playground for a public school. Mm. Interesting, right? Mm -hmm. But this client, uh, uh, Rick uh, Wixon, he's got amazing uh, materials. And he wanted me to look at his materials and I was like floored. He had this eight foot diameter steel culvert that you could walk through and you could go underneath and it like echoes. So he's got two of those. So we're gonna meet we're gonna move that to the playground and that's gonna be the entrance to the playground. So kids have to oh, run neat. through this tunnel. Yeah. It's not buried or anything, it just sits on the ground. Right. And that's gonna be a fantastic entrance to a playground. Well I, I love that idea of uh, of coming through something. I, I love that as a kid and as an adult coming through something as a visual person and how that opens up and also the corresponding sound of things opening up, it really can articulate. Really yeah, clearly. you're exactly right about that. I mean, and those kind of like playful things still resonate. I mean, you, it still resonates with you. Yeah. You're no longer a kid, but you're a kid at heart, right? <laughs> yeah. Me too. And so that whole thing about play is like you got to put yourself in like, what do I like to do outside? Mm -hmm. It's like playing culverts, you know. And a good place to end, which is uh, just a, a um, another piece that we had some... Uh, common ground on was the outdoor classroom in South Burke. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, part of an initiative there, simply to get kids outside to, uh, to to make it more porous between the inside of the classroom and the outside world that where the kids live. Uh, and I know you had a, a, a say, a, you know, intimate hand in the space outside of the school. 
Yeah, and, and you were involved in that because you, your son. <laughs> he loved playing. The, your the, son was area. one of the first. He was the first kid on the climbing mounds, and he was trying to do it with his bicycle, <laughs> and he did it. And I was like, I was, I was trying to tell Miles, Miles, get off, let the soil settle in for a little bit before. <laughs> he was the first kid out there. Uh, yeah, but I, I. Uh, I used to go to that playground with my daughter, who was a little kid at the time, uh, you know, before she was in school there. And it was just play structure and then, at, you know, uh, abandoned athletic field. There was a football field and then there was just invasive plant materials. So there's no landscape other than athletic turf and then, you know, memorial road, thorny memorial rose on the edge. So I just walked into the principal's office, Vicki Stewart, who was an amazing woman in a lot of ways. and. I, I said, I have an idea for your site. Here it is. I had already draw it. I drew it out already. I didn't give her a chance to weigh in on it. I just, I said, I have an idea for your property. I walked in there and she said, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> it's like, so she, she loved everything. And then her, some of her staff loved everything. Kate Smith, the music teacher. And so we converted what was a, an abandoned landscape into kind of a botanical cultural park, you know, it, you know, the athletic fields were still used for athletics, but they had meadows. There was a lot of, you know, native plant materials that we planted with families. Climbing mounds, birch alleys that kids can run with, uh, run through, you know, climbing stones. Um, and then Bill Raynaud took out the drainage system that all the pipes so we could expose the flow of water on the site and create a, a stone uh, rain garden in there. So there's a lot of, you could see the, 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 natural patterns happen and there was all new plant materials and new spaces instead of just like an athletic field that ed was edged with invasive plants so it was really because I had an idea but the school system was very supportive and they were always encouraging and then we just got a lot of community people to donate all the materials so it cost hardly any money mm -hmm. and then Kathy Gunst the sh local chef was able to you know use her persuasive techniques to get a um, a greenhouse, uh, you know, so the kids can grow their own food for the cafeteria. So it, it worked on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. A lot of community input, a lot of community support and participation. So that was the big thing. You, you know, these projects build communities. So I, I'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up because you're, you were part of that community. Mm -hmm. And um, so the climbing mounds are pretty magical. And I use, whenever I do a playground, I try to do some form of a climbing mound because they're so they animate kids so much. And, and, you know, I think a good reason why we have had such fertile uh, common ground in terms of the work that I do and the projects that I've had the fortune of uh, working with you on is that common bond of building community. Of, of, of yeah, yeah, you're in, the same, you're in the same business. You're just doing it from another angle. Yeah. Yeah, so you're one of the creators, too, so you ought to be in this chair. Well, I like this chair better. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the offer. <laughs> Um, well, Terrence, thank you so much for coming in this morning, for uh, uh, having great hair to highlight the, uh, the nice backlit sun there. <laughs> oh, it just stands up now. <laughs> it's perfect. So uh, we'll hear about uh, more projects uh, as life moves on. I hope and, so. Yeah. And I hope to get you involved, too. Excellent. Well, I, I love it. Thanks for having me, Bill. You bet. So thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in this morning. Um, Give us that thumbs up if you like what you see here. And uh, we'll catch you next time on the Creators of Some City.